Beyond the Front Line from SAS Rogue Heroes The Authorised Wartime History by Ben McIntyre A sudden influx of troops arrived from an unexpected quarter in early spring. A contingent of 52 free French paratroopers under the command of Colonel Georges Berge. These paratroopers were, in Sterling's words, tough cases. Intensely patriotic Frenchmen who had escaped Nazi-occupied France and trained as parachutists in Britain. They were keen for any opportunity to take the fight to the Germans and were happy to do so under British command. Most of the British officers had at least a smattering of French and a few of the French parachutists spoke English. Even so, to avoid linguistic confusion, it was agreed that the smaller fighting units would usually be composed of one nationality or the other, while operating under Stirling's overall command. Mixing French and British soldiers might have been a recipe for tension. In fact, though the forces teased one another endlessly, relations were almost uniformly peaceful. French troops would play a vital part in the evolution of the SAS. The new men required training in explosives, desert warfare and night operations. Parachute instruction continued because Sterling considered jumping out of planes to be a good basis for judgment of character of the new volunteers. With Jock Lewes gone, Sterling had lost a superb trainer. To replace him as training officer, Sterling chose the man who was living proof of the effectiveness of Lewes's methods, Paddy Main. While Sterling, Seekings, Cooper and a dozen others would head to Boerat to sink ships, Main was instructed to remain in camp in Cabrit to train up the new recruits. To say that Main was upset by this order does not quite do justice to the depths of his rage. His manner on receiving the news was icy cold, just one shade short of open insubordination. I could see that he was exasperated, wrote Sterling, who nonetheless insisted that he had no one else capable of this assignment. Maine, however, sensed that he was being left behind by Sterling because of the unstated but intense personal rivalry between them. Maine had destroyed dozens of planes, whereas Sterling had yet to record a single kill. The more junior officer was convinced, perhaps with reason, that this was a ploy to enable Sterling to even up the score and perhaps even overtake his bag of aircraft. Maine managed to control his temper but as he accepted the order, Sterling noted that his tone of voice was somewhat ominous. Sterling may have wondered on the drive back why he and his men had found the harbour empty. The answer came from the BBC. As the jubilant party neared Jalu, 
a radio bulletin relayed some disturbing news. The pendulum of the wider war had swung again. Rommel had counterattacked, retaking Benghazi and pushing the British back across Libya as far as Gazala, reconquering the territory he had so recently lost. Deprived of wireless contact, Sterling had been completely unaware of the battle. With the recapture of Benghazi, Burat was no longer Rommel's major port. The LRDG had already pulled out of Jalu, which would also soon be back in enemy hands as Rommel continued his advance. Sterling finally got back to Cabrit. After just two weeks away, the war looked very different. Sterling found Paddy Main in his tent, morosely drunk and reading a book in bed. A place and a state he had been in ever since the raiding party had departed without him. Instead of training the new recruits as instructed, he had pushed two beds together and climbed in, together with a stock of paperbacks, mostly poetry and a large supply of whiskey. Sterling seldom lost his temper. Maine lost his frequently. On a few occasions when both events occurred simultaneously, the effect was spectacular. The sight of his best soldier skulking in bed, surrounded by bottles, triggered what Sterling, with typically delicate euphemism, called a very heavy storm. A ferocious shouting match erupted, clearly audible to the rest of the camp that lasted for more than an hour. When the hurricane finally subsided, another bottle was opened and the two men settled down to the only intimate conversation they would ever have together. For perhaps the first time, Maine spoke of Owen McGonigal, his closest friend, who had perished in the first raid. I don't think I had realised until then just how close Paddy had been to Owen McGonigal or what the relationship had been. Sterling later wrote a little cryptically. Paddy was able to relax totally with him. Owen was able to communicate with Paddy on a different level. Sterling, in turn, opened up about the bitter disappointment and sense of failure that he had felt on being told he would never be an artist. The frustration was so great he told Maine, that it drove me to compensate by tackling the most exacting physical goal I could set myself, the climbing of Everest. That admission of frailty seemed to touch a chord in Paddy Maine. It was the look in Paddy's eyes in response to this conversation, rather than what he said, which was incoherent, which convinced me that he himself was suffering from extreme frustration, Sterling later wrote. The only thing he wanted to do, he said, was right. Sterling felt that he had discovered something about the demons that drove 
petty man. As there was no outlet for his creative energy, it got bottled up to an intolerable level. This led to some of his heavy drinking bouts, some of his violent acts, and his black moods. The unfulfilled writer inside Maine, Sterling believed, had gone completely unrecognized. Except by his mother, and perhaps by Owen McGonigal, explaining his mood swings and his aggression, but also his astonishing intuition and inspiration on the field of battle. During that long, drunken exchange of confidences, Maine had hinted at his own internal frustrations, artistic and literary, but perhaps also psychological and sexual. Sterling never forgot the conversation that took place after this, their most bitter confrontation. He would be haunted by the enigma of Maine's contradictory character for the rest of his life. His capacity for love and devotion on an almost spiritual level, combined with a sexual indifference to females and males, and his social avoidance of women, his compassion and gentleness in his day-to-day -day life, thought Sterling, contrasted with the bursts of extreme violence, sometimes even against those who were close to him. At the end of the evening, the two men shook hands and parted amicably. Maine seemed immune to hangovers, either alcoholic or emotional. And by the next morning, he was back functioning with redoubtable vigour. Sterling was honest enough to admit that forcing Maine to take on a training role had been a dreadful mistake. Pat Riley, now Sergeant Major, was appointed as training officer in his place. Paddy Main would return to fighting on the front line or, more accurately, beyond it.